I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to today's monthly webinar uh, in coordination with MP, Wired for HR, and the New England Livery Association. Topic of today's presentation is going to be Work Opportunity Tax Credits, commonly known as WOTC, uh, Proven Strategies and Best Practices. So looking forward to, to talking about this topic. Um, it's really something where I think the hope is so many businesses were fortunate enough to take advantage of tax credit programs during the pandemic um, and other stimulus such as PPP, employee retention tax credits, what have you, um, that you know this is this is something that's been around for quite a while. We'll go into the background of, of WOTC, but uh, the hope is that now that businesses are kind of used to jumping through the hoops that they need to to get some financial relief and some financial incentives from the government, um, that a program like this, which is somewhat evergreen, um, will be a little bit more approachable uh, in the coming months and years. So that's the hope. But uh, uh, anyway, let's get right into it. So for those of you who are not familiar, um, MP is a full service human capital management company. We offer a number of different related services, everything from HR advisement, payroll, benefits admin, time and attendance, and things of that nature. Um, we use a technology called iSolved, and then we, we back that up with industry leading customer service and support. I will be a presenter today. My name is Paul Corellis. I lead the HR services and tax credit services here at MP. Uh, been with the company a little bit over eight years and uh, look forward to talking to you about this. Just one quick disclaimer here. Um, <clears throat> this training is intended for educational purposes coming from an HR best practices uh, perspective. I am not an attorney. Please don't construe anything as legal advice, uh, especially when it comes to WOTC. Um, it is always a good idea to talk, talk to your accountant or professional tax preparer as well regarding these matters and how they may apply to your business. So in terms of what we plan to cover today, we'll do an overview and a history of the WOTC program. We'll talk about the current state of it. Um, <clears throat> what it looks like today. We'll go into some level of detail in regards to the eligibility category. So there are 10 different categories um, of candidates who may be eligible for WOTC credits. We'll discuss and go through the process of how to take advantage of the program. And then throughout, we will uh, discuss tips, tricks, and best practices as well. If you do have any questions during the session today, please utilize the Q&A feature within Zoom. We'll answer what we can. This is a fairly complex program, so there may be a question that you have that requires a little bit of additional research. We are happy to do that, so feel free to, to ask away and we'll answer what we can. And if there are anything, any questions we can't answer here live, then we'll make sure that we get back to you as soon as possible. Okay, so in terms of the history of the program, WOTC actually dates back to 1996. It was written into a bill called the Small Business Protection Act and signed into law at that time. Um, throughout time, it's been passed for a limited time period. So generally like three to five years is, is how long it will be renewed. Um, it was most recently renewed, I believe in 2019 or early 2020. Um, they reauthorized the Work Opportunity Tax Credit Program through December 31st of 2025. So um, even if you aren't taking advantage of it now or aren't planning on doing any hiring right now, it is still a program that will be around for at least a couple more years. And um, they do seem to re keep, keep renewing it. It's a good program. Um, I don't foresee them canceling at any time in the near future. As I said before, there are 10 different qualified groups who qualify for WOTC. We'll talk about the certification process in a few minutes, 
But in terms of statistical data, there were over 2 million certifications issued to employers in the last fiscal year. So what that basically means is that there were over 2 million new hires who were approved to be eligible for WOTC. Uh, they didn't really track the actual credits after they performed some work, but um, there were basically a little over 2 million people pre-approved for the program, meaning employees. The most popular category of certifications, because they do track the data for that, um, were office and administrative support positions. That being said, there are people in, in pretty much every imaginable job title and role um, who have been certified to be eligible for WOTC. So certainly isn't limited to office ad admin support, but that does tend to be the most popular placement. All right, so as promised, let's talk about the categories of eligibility. So um, as much as I hate to do it, these slides do have a lot of text on them. I wanted to make sure we included all of the ins and outs of each program and eligibility for each category. Um, fear not if you're not a good note taker. We will provide you know everyone who registered a PDF copy of these slides so that if you need to go back and reference any of these categories, um, you'll have this at your fingertips and, and don't need to uh, rely on notes. And we'll also share a recording of today's presentation as well. So uh, <clears throat> the first category is a qualified veteran. So to be considered a qualified veteran under WOTC, um, a member of the employee's family must be receiving assistance under SNAP uh, there, it can meet any one of these. This does not have to be an all-inclusive list. They would need to meet one of these bullets. So first would be um, the family is receiving SNAP uh, or food stamps or EBT for at least three months uh, during the first 15 months of their employment. Um, the second way a veteran can be qualified is if they've been unemployed for at least four weeks, uh, but less than six months in the year before they they're hired by you. Alternatively, they can be a long-term unemployed, meaning that they've been unemployed for a combined amount of at least six months in the one year period before they were hired by you. Uh, they also qualify if they're a disabled veteran due to a, a disability from related to their service in the military. Um, as long as it hasn't been more than one year since they were discharged or released from duty. They can also be a qualified veteran um, who was unemployed for at least six months, um, regardless of how long ago they were discharged. The next category and Understand some people are, are less open to this. Um, it is becoming a, a hiring strategy for certain businesses and in certain industries. Um, and there is ta officially tax incentive through WOTC for this um, is the hiring of ex-felons. So to have a employee who qualifies as a WOTC eligible ex-felon, you would need to be hiring them within one year of either their conviction or their release from from prison due to that felony charge or conviction. The third WOTC category is for qualified long-term unemployed individuals. So these folks need to be unemployed for at least 27 consecutive weeks at the time of hire um, and have been eligible for unemployment during at least some some of that time period. So it doesn't matter if their unemployment ran out, it's really the 27 consecutive weeks um, of continuous unemployment. Next is what's called residents of a designated community. So these individuals need to be over the age of 18 or 18 or older and under 40, and then they need to live within one of these specified zones, either what the government designates as an empowerment zone, a government designated enterprise community, a government designated renewal community, and they need to continue living 
at in those zones while they are employed by you. So you couldn't say go travel to an empowerment zone out of state, recruit up all the people in there and then bring them to your business location, assuming that your business is not located in an empowerment zone. So they they need to continue living in that in that empowerment zone to be eligible. This category is a little cloudy right now because the empowerment zone definitions all expired about a year ago, a little over a year ago, actually. Um, so on a state by state level, states are recertifying their, um, their definitions of empowerment zones. We do have a list and we can provide a link to the Department of Labor site that's keeping track of all the eligible empowerment zones. Um, and we'll be able to provide that to everybody on the call today. Um, but it is it is great, especially for certain communities, if, if your business is located in one of these or neighboring one of these, um, it can create, you know, these, these credits add up quickly. And if you're hiring people from those cities and those zip codes, um, you can get a pretty sizable credit fairly quickly. Next is a category of vocational rehabilitation of individuals. So these wouldn't be people that you would necessarily find from a job posting or you know find on the street, so to speak. These would be people that you'd be working in conjunction with certain agencies um, that specialize in working with physical and mental disabilities. Um, I know here in here in New England. Programs such as the Northeast Arc would would likely be a source of candidates like this, uh, but other other related um, networks as well. But hiring centers and and places that work with individuals who have disabilities, um, those folks tend to be eligible for WOTC as well. Next are, are summer youth employees. So this may not pertain to the transportation industry so much. And to be honest, this is the least least used WOTC eligibility category. But as you can imagine for some businesses, and certainly um, if you do have the need for summer help and summer only help, then, or just looking to stop gap and hire whoever you can and, and get some credits if they're available, this could be an interesting category for you as well. Maybe they do some some jobs around the office, who knows. But so these folks would need to be over 16, but under 18, um, only employed between May 1st and September 15th, um, and then also reside in one of those zones we talked about a couple of slides ago. Next eligibility would be SNAP recipients. So SNAP um, sometimes referred to as food stamps, sometimes referred to as EBT, um, all the same federal program. So individuals 18 or older, under 40, whose family received SNAP benefits for the previous six months, or at least three of the previous five months, would be eligible for WOTC under this category. And then we have what's called the Qualified 4A recipients. So these would, you know, just for, for purposes of understanding, um, you know, the, the, the names of these programs have changed over time for various reasons. These would be your traditional welfare recipients, um, transitional assistance recipients, uh, what have you. But so if a member of the employee's family is receiving temporary assistance for needy families via the, their state, um, for a nine month period in the year and a half before they start for you, uh, you could be eligible for WOTC under the qualified 4A recipient category. There is also uh, a category for long-term family assistance. So receiving those same benefits um, for the previous 18 consecutive months before hire, um, or at least not not dating back more than two years since the 18 month period that they received benefits.
So those are your categories in a nutshell. If you have a recent hire, very recent hire, who falls into one of those categories and is willing to fill out the, the paperwork to attest to that, you could be in line for some WANSI credits. So how do you go about claiming these credits? It's really important that you act timely with your new hires if you feel you have a WOTC opportunity. So while this is a federal program, it's completely managed at the state level in terms of certifying um, and approving candidates. So each state has its own agency dedicated to processing WOTC. And they are pretty stringent about following the timelines required. So your best friend in this process is going to be what's called Form 8850. That's the form to certify a candidate. That form needs to be completed no later than 28 days after the employee is hired. So this isn't one of those programs where you want to save up all your forms from your new hires and send, send them in at the end of the year like a Christmas club. It's really important that uh, these get filled out right along the best best practice for us if you look at the form it says to have it filled out before the offer of employment is made i find it to be a best practice to have it completed with the new hire paperwork and while they're filling out their w4 and their i9 and all that fun stuff you can have the 8850 in there as part of that as well once that is completed um, and you see that there is the potential that based on what they filled in on the 8850 that um, there's a chance they could be eligible for WOTC. You would then have them fill out a form, in most cases, 9061. So the 9061 just asks additional information about their eligibility. If they're coming from one of those rehabilitation programs that we talked about before, um, it's a slightly different form in 9062. In most cases, it's going to be a 9061. If, it's, if they're coming to you as long-term unemployed, um, so someone that's been unemployed for six months or longer, there's a third form for them. But always the 8850, once that shows signs of a potential credit, you then have them fill out one of those three other forms. So in most cases, 9061. If they're coming from an agency, 9062. If they're long-term unemployed, 9175. You would gather up those forms and then send them to the respective state agency. Um, where the person is being employed. They would then review them and then let you know the certification status from there. The second step in the process would be to monitor their hours and their wages um, and calculate the potential credit. So in most cases, <clears throat> An employee needs to work at least 120 hours in their first year of employment to be eligible for any WOTC. If you're hiring someone that's the Title IV-A recipients, or the short term or long term, they need to work 400 hours. There's no partial credit for anything less than 400 hours for those folks. Everyone else, all the other categories, there is at least a partial credit if they work 120 hours or more in the first year. Credit available varies. So for most categories of eligibility, the credit caps at 40% of $6,000 in wages. So you're looking at a $2,400 credit for an employee who works more than 400 hours and has more than $6,000 of wages in that first year. So a $2,400 max credit in most cases. If you have someone who fails to meet that 400 hour threshold, the percentage of the credit drops to 25%. And again, it would be for no more than $6,000 in wages. <clears throat> um, certain qualified veterans do have a larger wage base. So if you have a qualified veteran that meets the eligibility criteria for this higher wage base, you can get up to 40% of $24,000 in wages. So those veteran groups, you can get a, a work opportunity tax credit of up to $9,600 per individual. So, you know, obviously not the same kind of figures that we were talking about with ERTC, for instance, in some situations, but these can add up fast. So if you're a business that does a fair amount of hiring, it adds up really fast. But even if you're not, 
Um, it is a good incentive if if you tend to be hiring folks that may fall into these categories as it is. Um, it's really a no brainer and, and an opportunity to get some some additional tax credit revenue in the house. So once you've kind of calculated and confirmed that people have met the hours thresholds and figured out, you know, that they've um, earned sufficient wages and all of that, the way that you actually go about claiming the credit for those folks who were pre-certified is to file form 5884 with your annual tax income tax filings for the business. And on that form is where you would claim the credit. So unlike ERTC, which was a refundable credit, the WATSI program is not a refundable credit. So the amount that you can claim in a given year cannot exceed your business your business's income tax liabilities um, combined with your employer social security tax liabilities. Um, one thing to remember though is that there is the opportunity to kind of roll roll the credit forward. So the WADSI program does allow you to apply the credit up to one year back, so one year previous, or up to 20 years forward. So if you did end up with a huge WADSI credit at any given time and you didn't have enough tax liability to offset it, you can continue to roll that forward um, until you use it up up to 20 years. So what are some best practices? Um, just a great idea, you know, no harm, no foul in baking this into your onboarding process. So, you know, adding it to your new hire packet, Form 8850, just to see see what you get. Now, um, the e Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the EEOC has given its blessing in terms of using that form and asking those questions that it doesn't violate any employee rights for equal employment opportunity. Um, that being said, if someone declines to fill out the form, you don't want to make it mandatory or or really require it. It is kind of a, a voluntary thing, obviously. There are some sensitive questions being asked in terms of financial economic situation, um, you know, things of that nature. So um, most employees and employers don't have an issue getting it filled out. Um, you just want to be mindful of that. And if it is something you're pursuing, feel free to make this and leverage it as part of your recruitment efforts with with the group. So if you're, um, you know, if you are in a position or of of the mind to be working with um, <clears throat> groups, that, you know, incarcerated individuals, you know, promote that. Let let people know that you're open to giving people second chances. Um, if you're hiring in certain communities, you know, promote that as well, whatever it may be. Um, but, but use this as a, as a way to kind of leverage and, and increase your recruitment efforts. I think something that, you know, a, a resource that's out there that many businesses don't take advantage of, or at least don't take advantage of it to the extent that they could, um, there are a lot of both federal and, and state level and community level workforce agencies. Um, that have candidates uh, that may not be, you may not be finding in your traditional recruitment methods. They might not be scouring Indeed or, you know, wherever else you're, you're putting job postings and looking for uh, candidates. Um, but they may be chock full of candidates and candidates that could be WASI eligible as well. So don't forget about your your local and community resources and job centers, workforce agencies. Um, those could be great, great sources of talent to help round out your team. You do want to make sure that you file these certifications timely. So again, um, I have ran into situations where people kind of sat on these forms, didn't send them in until, you know, months and months later, and they did get rejected by the agency. So it is really important to note that um, they do take that 28 day time period seriously, and you you could run the risk of not having your candidates certified if you if you go beyond the 28 days after hire. And then finally, as I said, um, even if you do have a large WOTC credit and aren't going to be getting a check for that in the mail, you can carry it forward up to 20 years.
Okay, so we do have a couple questions here. Um, in terms of taking advantage of the program, <clears throat> depending on who you work with for payroll, there, there may be different options available. So if any of you are MP clients, um, through our electronic onboarding option, there is also the option to do Watsi service. So basically how that would work is that um, we would put in there the 8850 as part of your electronic onboarding. So when you have a new hire and they're completing their electronic onboarding forms, they would complete the 8850 as part of that. Um, and then uh, should, should they qualify, um, our team would work with whoever needed to gather the information and submit submit the certifications and help with the tracking and the, the claiming of the credit as well. Um, many other payroll companies have, have similar programs as well. So um, the fees for that vary, but it is something worth looking into if you're concerned about the, the paperwork burden. That being said, if you're not, um, it is a fairly straightforward program that can be managed in house as well. So if, if folks want to start baking this into this pro into their process, um, it is fairly user friendly once you figure out which state you're in, which state agency to send it to and kind of take it from there. Another question, um, where can you find info on hiring former inmates? Good question. So we can um, provide that as part of our follow up in terms of some potential resources for hiring inmates for those who are interested in doing so. All right, so it looks like those are the questions that, that we had from the presentation today. Again, if you do ever have a question HR related, um, whether it be on this topic or anything else, employee relations or HR matters, please do utilize the NILA resource through MP. Um, that can be accessed via the web at mp-hr.com slash NILA. Um, you can ask a question there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, submit it. Um, those emails get forwarded to our HR team who will promptly respond and, and pick up the phone if necessary to help you out with your HR sort of situation. Um, but with that, that concludes today's session. Again, please do reach out to us should you ever have any questions. But otherwise, have a great afternoon and we'll talk to you again next month. Thank you.